the book of Amos in chapter number 2. The book of Amos chapter 2. Amos chapter 2 this morning, and we're going to begin reading in verse number 4. Amos chapter 2 and verse number 4. The Bible says, Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have despised the law of the Lord and have not kept his commandment, commandments, and their lies caused them to err, after the which their fathers have walked. But I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. Again, this morning, we often do this, but with such a short text, let's take the time to read it once again. Thus saith the Lord, For three transgressions of Judah and for four, I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have despised the law of the Lord, and have not kept his commandments. Their lies caused them to err, after the which their fathers have walked. But I will send a fire upon Judah, and it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. Our title this morning is this, The Sins of the Good Kids. The Sins of the Good Kids. Lord, would you help my spirit this morning, and uh, Lord, my walk with you, my desire to please you, Lord, that it would be right, that my motives would be right, that Lord, you and I would be good. I trust you'll use your word as you see fit, uh, Lord, that it would be a balm to some, and it might be a prod to others. Lord, uh, and may we just put it forth and allow you to, uh, Lord, make application of it as you see fit. Lord, uh, please be with Brother Lowry today as he travels, he and his wife. Lord, with heavy hearts as they come home uh, for a, a couple of weeks, Lord, in the passing of his brother. Thank you, Lord, for salvation. Thank you that salvation is eternal and not, Lord, based upon our work or effort. Lord, that in spite of the fact that his brother... Uh, was not faithful at the end, you were faithful at the end. And so we rejoice in our salvation, Lord, in that. Help us, Lord, to do right today. Help us to be made more like you today. Help us to love you more today. In Jesus' name we would ask it. Amen. My wife and I were watching television this week, and uh, probably not a great way to start a sermon, but uh, my wife and I were watching television this week, and we were watching a program, and my wife said this. My wife goes, that character reminds me of the older brother in the story of the prodigal son. Because he's the good kid in the story, he's the, he's the good kid in the show, and yet he's not acting like a good kid at the moment. Come on, we all know what that's like, where there are people who are the good kids, and yet they're not, they're not acting uh, in the good kid manner. They're messing up a lot. We typically do put people into categories, don't we? No, no, I'm not saying it's right or wrong, but undeniably, we tend to put people in categories. That's a good person, that's a bad person, that's a, a faithful person, that's an unfaithful person, uh, that's someone who's going to be helpful, that's somebody who's not going to be helpful. We typically do put people into categories. And now uh, we also typically put sins in categories. Come on, if, if nothing else, sins of commission, sins that people do when they, things they do with the, that they're not supposed to, and sins of omission, Sins when we don't do what we are supposed to do would be just a, a general category of sin, but categories also of kind of the, the big sins, the lesser sins, the more socially acceptable sins. Uh, I mean, you're looking at me funny, but, but, but we understand what we're talking about this morning. So in our text today, we're reading about the country of Judah. He finally gets to Judah, all right? Remember, he's been highlighting other country sins to teach Israel a lesson. He's shining a light on them to teach us. This is a rarity in Scripture. He, he doesn't often do it like this, where most of the time when God shines a light, we'll just, for sake of argument this morning, shines a light on Brother Keezer's sin, he's doing so so that Brother Keezer would fix his own sin. In this situation, he's shining a light on Brother Keezer's sin so that we might learn from his sin and not suffer the same fate as him, all right? Because, the, again, the school of experience is, uh, 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 has a high education, but also has a very high cost. And so he's trying to get us to avoid those things. So he's been talking primarily of heathen cultures and heathen places, Gaza and Tyrus, uh, Tyrus Edom, Amnon, etc. And now he finally gets down to the country of Judah. 
Judah is the good. Even of the nations of Israel, the northern tribes and the southern tribes, Judah would be the good kids. They would be the ones who have done right, or at least the ones who have done right the most. If you're grading on a curve, a very big curve in some cases, all right, being generous there uh, uh, for them. But now we're learning, we're learning of the sins of Judah, and then in verse number 6, we'll finally get to the sins of Israel. That's who he's actually talking to, all right? So in verse number uh, 3 and 4, he's talking to the good kids, and he's shining a light on them to teach us a lesson, teach the nation of Israel. We are not the nation of Israel, but because he recorded it for us in Scripture and preserved it for us until now, it's to teach us a lesson, all right? So we are to learn from these experiences. Verse number 4, Thus saith the Lord, for three transgressions of Judah and for four. So once again, the same introduction is to every country has been the same thing. For three transgressions or for four. This is a repeated action. No, no, the sins of Judah here are a repeated action. This is not a single solitary event. Uh, uh, we have a garage in our, at our home, and we have a, a garage door. You know, you push the button, and the garage door goes down. And uh, on Tuesday mornings, we have trash day. And so Mondays, Mark will open the garage door, take out the trash, and put it down at the end and whatnot. And uh, uh, imagine on Tuesday morning, uh, you wake up, and I leave to go to work, and our garage door's up. Mark forgot to put it down. And then you're like, oh, what do you, I mean, come on, Mark, what are you doing? We've got um, things out there, in, things in a safe out there. And that's as far as we'll go online, all right? And so and you're like, you gotta, you got to shut the garage door down. Well, he says, okay, no problem. The next week, same thing happens. Next week, same things happens. Next week, same things happen. At some point in time, you're going to get the idea, it's not so much that he forgets to put the garage door down, he doesn't really care to put the garage door down. He doesn't really care what I'm saying to him. Some of you are like, Mark's a nice kid. No, no, this is illustration purposes only, okay? Uh, we're, just, we're just saying that for three transgressions or for four, Judah's rebellious. It's typically not what we do one time that will destroy us. It's what we do over and over and over again. I don't know where they get these statistics, but they say uh, for every one time a person gets a DUI, they've likely driven as many as 50 times without getting caught. Come on. So if you've got multiple DUIs, that means you've probably committed that crime multiple upon multiple upon multiple occasions. So don't this morning go, well, the Old Testament God is so vengeful and so... No, 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 no. He's merciful. He didn't whack them the first time they did this. He didn't destroy them the first time they did this. He's punishing them now after they have done it repeatedly multiple, multiple, multiple times how long-suffering God is. No, I said how long-suffering God is. Verse number four. As we continue on, he tells us what they have done repeatedly that is the cause of their judgment. I will not turn away the punishment thereof, because they have despised the law of the Lord. They have despised the law of the Lord. Now, we have defined this word several times, so forgive us if this is repetitive to you this morning, but there are some in the room that may not know the word or be acquainted with how it's used in the King James English and some that might be tuning in online. When I think of the word despised, I think of like, I don't know, livered onions. Okay? I'm not, I'm not indifferent about livered onions, okay? I, I, I hate, like, there is not a, a time or a place or where I want livered onions. I, I despise them, okay? I am indifferent towards, like, I don't know, peas. Like, if somebody puts peas on my plate, I'm not like, ah. But if somebody puts peas on my plate, I'm not like, yes. They're just kind of... There, I mean, you know, I would, never, I would never scoop up peas and put them on my plate, but if it's in my chicken pot pie, I'll eat them. Come on, I'll, I'll eat them. If it's in, a, if it's in a, a, a sandwich or something with some kind of chicken, I'll eat it, but I'm not, I'm not, I, I, no, 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 no. Livered onions, no way, no how. Peas, okay. In our textual definition here of despised, peas would be in the despised category. It's not that they hate them, livered onions, it's that they lightly esteem them. They, they, they have rejected them. Uh, they have cast them away. They have refused them. They're just not 
very high on the, on the list. We're kind of indifferent towards it. I mean, we're not spitting on it. We're not, you know, throwing our plate with the food, chucking it out the window when someone's not looking. But we're also not really all that hip on it either. Okay? So when it says the nation of Judah has despised the word of the Lord, it's not that they have cast it aside and rejected it like we want nothing to do with the word of God. We want nothing to do with the things of God. No, 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 that's not it at all. They just, there's things they'd rather have. Oh, come on now. I, I, I'm using that expression too, too, too often, too frequently when I say, oh, come on now. But you're, you're, you catch what I'm trying to say. I'm trying to get with us. I doubt very seriously anybody got up this morning and came to church, uh, 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 to Sunday school, in time for Sunday school, they goes, I hate the Bible. I hate the Word of God. I dislike, I mean, every time it's preached, my ears bleed. I just, by the way, if that's true, you got trouble. You got multiple troubles if that's, if that. But have we ever gotten to the place where we're like, you know, there are things I'd rather have. Uh, there are not things that we'd rather, that we'd not, not rather participate in. He's talking here about the law of, uh, when he says the law, this would be the first five books of the, law, the Bible, the law of Moses. Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. By the way, uh, I think I can say this without God striking me dead. Not exactly the, uh, um, the favorites in the Bible as far as our Bible reading. The book of Genesis, probably, the book of beginnings, and, and maybe even the book of Exodus and the story of deliverance and whatnot. Then we get into Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy, and we're just kind of like, uh, uh, uh. especially in comparison to like, I don't know, the book of Hebrews, the book of James, uh, uh, First and Second Peter, First and Second Corinthians. I mean, the books of the New Testament would, would probably, most of them anyway, would come in ahead on the favorites list. So they didn't even have the New Testament. They didn't have all of the Old Testament yet because it's still being written here in our text. And so the books that they did have weren't exactly the, the height of, uh, uh, of excitement and exhilaration, and yet God is condemning them, God is judging them, because they had devalued or lowered the priority of the Word of God in their life. The law would say, do this. And they would go, ah. I don't think. The law would say, don't do that. And they would go, well, I mean, maybe if I only did it once. They had, listen, follow me here. Something else or someone else was substituted for what God said. Let me repeat that. Something else or someone else was substituted for what God had said in his word. Israel, excuse me, Judah is, is uh, 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 guilty of the crime of not taking the Bible and going, I hate the Bible and chucking it out of the way. But rather, they had lowered it. They had devalued it in their mind and in their life where there were other things that were now of more consequence, of more significance, of more mm, influence than this. Perhaps we have been guilty of that as times too. Our emotions cover or mean more than what the Bible says. What do you mean by that? Well, I don't know. You're fighting with your wife and, and the Bible says that we're to be honoring to her as unto the weaker vessel. We know that's what the Bible says. But man, we've got that zinger. We've got that statement that's going to put her in her place. I guess I'm the only sinner here this morning. We know what the Bible says, but we substitute our emotion instead of what the Bible says. We act on our emotion instead of what the Bible says. You know what we just did? We just lowered the Bible. We didn't cast it out. I didn't say you set fire to it. No, no, you lowered it, and you placed your emotions on a higher plane than it. That your emotions and your feelings matter more to you than thus saith the Lord. We often do it with family. We often do it with family where family dictates what we do instead of the Bible dictating what we do. Family reunions or, 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 or pressure to miss church or, or whatever it is. We go, but it's, and, and, and I've heard this often as a pastor, but it's family. But it's family. And my answer to that would be, but it's the Bible. 
It's the word of the Lord, all right? And that would be an example of, I didn't say you hate the Bible. I didn't say you're, you're cutting out portions of the Bible or, or taking a, a spray can and spraying out different portions of the Bible. You wouldn't do that. You wouldn't, you wouldn't think of doing that. I, I wouldn't think you would think of doing that. But you have devalued it. You've lowered it beyond something else. Something else matters more. Circumstances, uh, perhaps. Well, I, I was going to, but circumstances changed. Circumstances changed. Uh, this morning, Brother Keezer and I were, uh, uh, were talking, and by talking, I mean I was talking to him, and he was letting me vent a little. It was nice. And so this morning, I got, I got several texts, just multiple texts from people saying they weren't coming today. And my question was this. If they had Super Bowl tickets sitting outside, would they have still gone to the Super Bowl today? That's an assumption. That's a, that's a question. I, I don't know. But a lot of times I think the answer would be yes. I mean, like, I wouldn't even go to the Super Bowl if I had the tickets. Well, substitute a different illustration for you then. <laughs> Circumstances don't dictate right or wrong. Circumstances don't dictate right or wrong. And so you go, well, it was easy to serve God. Now it's hard to serve God, so I'm not going to serve God. What you did there not only is not serving God, you've devalued what the Bible says, and you've elevated your circumstances to, to the point where your circumstances matter more than what the Bible says. Now we're not talking about health concerns and all of those kinds of things. That is completely different. By the way, let's go back to the beginning of the verse. For three transgressions of Judah and for four. It's not like they had done this once. They had done this repeatedly. The nation of Judah had repeatedly gotten to the place where they devalued what God said and elevated what someone else said or elevated circumstances or elevated how they felt to the point where something else was of more value to them than the Bible. Something else carried more weight. Something else carried more clout. Something else carried more more emphasis in their life than thus saith the Lord. Now, by the way, that's the sin of a good Christian. No, that's who Judah represents in this text. They're, they're the good person in the text. Trust me, the next one is Israel. They're not going to be any better. They're actually far worse off. This morning, if I, if I told you I did some illicit drug this week, people would be like, if one of you said you did some illicit drug this week, people would be like. But if we just said this, I didn't read my Bible and instead I slept in 10 more minutes. I mean, we, none of us would be like, good job. But we also wouldn't be like, well, you know, I got to tell pastor. Come on, if Brother, McCurry, if Brother McCurry is doing some type of illicit drug and brags about it to Brother Jay, I would hope Brother Jay would be like, um... I kind of got to let pastor know that. If Brother McCurry goes, I missed a few days of devotions this week because I wanted to sleep in, Brother Jay would be like, well, I mean, read your Bible more, but he, he's not like freaking out that, that Brother Jay's like, I don't know, I'll narc on anybody for anything. <laughs> he's, he, he's like, I'm a narc, don't tell me, don't tell me, Jack. It's the sin of the good Christian, but it's a sin. It, 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 it's, a, it's a problem. It might manifest itself in, in various ways. This is perhaps an odd application initially, but I think we'll, we'll, we'll get to it and you'll, you'll see the, the value of it. When something is devalued, we will take less care of it. So this last week I was, I was blitzing, just you know, going door to door, putting flyers on the door. Brother Sean knows I do this. As I blitz, I always look for money. I'm, I'm always looking for coins. Now, if it's on people's property, I leave it on people's property. I do not touch it. If it's on the sidewalk, if it's on the street, it's mine. And so I'm walking and I see two pennies. Okay, I see two pennies. And I bend down and I pick them up. And I can tell, I can tell right away when I pick them up that they're older. One was a 1947, and one was a 1944 penny, a wheat head penny. They had the wheat head on the backside, 
And so I stuck them in my pocket and went about my business. I got home and I started to put them in the, in the little piggy bank where I put my, my change. And, and uh, I go, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take a look at these things because they're, they're weed head pennies. They're, they're kind of old. And so, I mean, I looked them up on eBay. So this is just eBay. This isn't don't, you know, cast aspersions that I didn't check with some officially, you know. But by and large, they're worth $1.89 a piece. A penny is worth $1.89 a piece. Okay, simple math. A penny's worth... But these pennies are worth 189 pennies. So they have 189 times in value. Rich. I'm telling you, serving God pays. Serving God pays. And so I'm super excited. And then so I'm reading the listing after I, I you know, pull it up and start checking. And it goes, but it must be in mint condition, in pristine condition was the term that they used. There's like nicks on the corners of it where it got ran over and crushed into the concrete. And there's some, some scratches and some... So where it should be valued at 189 times its original value, it's not. In fact, I, I, I probably couldn't even sell it for 50 cents. Why? Because it got devalued because of how it was handled. It got, it got devalued because of how it was handled. The nation of Judah devalued the word of God based on how they handled it. And it led to many problems, many more problems we'll get to here in just a moment. So if something is devalued, we'll take care of it less. When I first looked up and saw $1.89, I'm like, I'm going to take pictures of these things and sell them on eBay. And then I read that they have to be in pristine condition and mine aren't in pristine condition. So you know where they ended up? In my piggy bank with the rest of the pennies. Because they're devalued. The law of the Lord is perfect. It's complete, converting the soul. Heaven and earth shall pass away. My words shall never pass away, Jesus said. So if you take the Bible and you believe it to be perfect, and then you start allowing other people's thoughts and other people's emotions and other people's doctorate degrees to get you to begin to question the validity of the perfection of the Bible. Come on now. It will be worth less. If something is perfect, it is worth this. If something is less than perfect, regardless of how less, if something is perfect, it's worth this. If something is less than perfect, it can only be worth that. It is, listen, it's devalued. Come on, it's devalued. And this morning, there are many people, some with malicious intent and some with ignorant intent, but have devalued our scriptures and saying, well, you know, um, I mean, if you want to read the old King James English, you can do that. But there's a whole lot of other versions that are easier to read. And there are. There are. I'm here this morning to tell you, there are easier versions to read than the King James Bible, but easier doesn't mean correct. Easier doesn't mean better. A surgeon goes, we could uh, do surgery, we've got to crack open your chest and you know, uh, fix your arteries and da da da, -da. We, could, we, could, we could do all that, or you could just pop this pill. It's a whole lot easier. Will that fix the problem? No, but it'll make you so high you'll forget about it. Come on, which one do you want to take? The one fixes the problem. The one's much easier and just makes you forget about the problem. No, no, I, I want the perfection that is the Word of God. And there are so many that have devalued the King James Bible for other versions and other things that I have never, I have only, excuse me, not never, I have one time heard somebody make a case that there was a different version of the, in the English language that was perfect. Uh, but most of the time, they never say, you should read the NIV, it's perfect. You should read the ESV. It's perfect. You should read the good news for modern man. It's perfect. No, they don't say that. They say it's easier. Right. Why do we take away that which is perfect for something that which is easier? And if we do, listen, we have devalued it because it is no longer perfect in our mind and in our eyes. 
Well, let's read on. How did this affect them? Uh, uh, Because they have despised the law of the Lord, verse 4, and have not kept His commandments. They disobeyed God. They devalued the Word, and then they disobeyed God. That should make sense to us. If you do not value what the law says, there will come a point where you disobey it. Speed limit 65. What do you set your cruise at? <laughs> we have good sinners in our church. I knew I, could, I knew I could catch him with that one. 69. 70 is a sin, but 69, that's fine. You know why we think? Because we, we devalue the law. We said that it's not really that big a deal. The other day I heard on the radio, they're like, and this gentleman was doing 70 miles an hour in a 65 mile an hour zone. And I'm like, yeah, and most people were probably passing him. We, we just devalue the law. Mrs. Mrs. Hernandez is like, yeah, that's me. That's me. Guilty. Guilty. Sign me up. Don't ride with her. Um, <laughs> unless you're in a hurry. Um, we devalue the law. It's not, it's not, it's not that big a deal. Uh, at Heartland, um, they have signs up that say, please don't walk on the grass. Now, I'm not going to intentionally just walk across the grass. But there are floods of people. There might be 1,500 people in the auditorium and they dismiss. And now they're walking on these narrow passages. I'm not going to slip through people like this when there's a walkway in the grass. I'm just going to step on the grass and walk on the grass. I'm not going to intentionally violate the rule, but it's it's grass. Come on, it's not, it's not that big a deal. It's not, it's not that big of a crime. I don't think someone's going to come and take my ordination certificate because I walked on grass. But hear me, because they had devalued the law, they got to the place where they could break it, they thought, with impunity. It wasn't a big deal. I, I, a pastor friend of mine got a ticket in Windsor for doing 36 and a 35. I'm like, that police officer was having a bad day. But, but that shows us our mindset. Well, why did I get a ticket for doing 36 and a 35? Because the speed limit's 35. You, you broke the law. Devaluing the word will always lead you to disobeying the word. That's the key of the message this morning. Devaluing the word will always lead us to disobeying the word. Because if something else has more value, our opinion, our society, our experiences, our family, if that matters more than thus saith the Lord, then when it's convenient for us or beneficial for us to break the law of the Lord, we will break it and not really even give it a moment's thought. Because we've devalued it. When we remove the standard, don't expect behavior to go up. Come on. We have seen this in our public schools. This is not bashing public school time. This isn't, I promise. But we've seen it in our public schools. Um, we'll go real simple. Even with my kids' school. My kids go to private school, and they have a very simple letter, lettering grade now. If it's 90 or above, it's an A. If it's 80 or above, it's a B. If it's 70 or above, it's a C. If it's 60 or above, it's a D. If it's 50 uh, or uh, 59 and below, it's an F. Okay? So you can get an 80, and it's a B. When I was in high school, an 80 was a C minus. You got below an 80, it was a D. They lowered the standard. Are kids smarter today because they lowered the standard? Would we, would we put the average age and the average, excuse me, the average education, the average intellect of a 14, 15, 16-year-old who would come in on our buses this morning with the average 14, 15, or 16-year-old of 30 years ago? My mom got married at 16. My dad got married at 18. What would we think of the average 16 and 18-year-old that come into Calvary Baptist Temple getting married? We'd be like, y'all are dumb. You are not ready for this. Why? Part of it is because we've lowered the standard. We've lowered the expectation. We've devalued the standard. And by lowering the standard, you don't help people to meet the standard. You help people to feel comfortable about not meeting the standard. Repeatedly. 
repeatedly. Reading on in verse number four. Now we have to think just a little bit. We have to use some grammar here to, to, to get this. They have not kept his commandments. And their lies caused them to error. Now let's just stop right there. Their lies caused them to err. So the people who devalued the word are the people who disobeyed the word. And that caused them to error, to, to make mistakes. After the which their fathers have walked. So he connects it back. So we're talking about Brother Jay. We'll use Brother Jay, okay? So Brother Jay devalued the word. Then he disobeyed the word. And that caused him to error. In the same way he erred, that's what his fathers did. So this is a generational thing. All right? Uh, uh, re reading on. And their lies caused them to error, after the which their fathers have walked. Their lies. So it's not... They're adding, there's another sin here. It's not just that they are, Brother Jay is falling into the same trap of his dad, and so he's doing what his forefathers did. No, it says their lies. The lies that they told themselves in devaluing the word and disobeying caused them to err. It caused them to err in the same ways that their fathers erred. Can I suggest to you this morning that here's what happened? We're just using Brother Jay again just as an example. Brother Jay is looking at the life of his parents, uh, the life of his grandfather, the life of his, his forefathers, and he's looking them in light of the Word of God. And through the light of the Word of God, they're wrong. But he devalues the Word of God. He begins to disobey the Word of God. And now he looks at them, and he does one of two things. He justifies their actions, or he minimizes their sin. My dad drank, just illustration only. My dad drank, and so uh, drinking's wrong. The Bible says drinking's wrong. The Bible says drinking's wrong. But if I devalue the Bible where the Bible's no longer the standard, I can go by society. Come on, 60-some percent of Southern Baptists now say it's okay to drink. So if we just go by, 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 by other people being the standard, then we can, we can set it up where so it's wrong to drink. Bible says it's wrong to drink. But some of say it's okay to drink. My social group says it's okay to drink. So I'm going to drink. So as I start drinking, now I'm looking back at my dad, and I'm looking back at my grandfather and how they drank, and I'm saying to myself, you know what? They weren't really that bad. They were okay to drink because he had had a rough day. They were okay to drink because he was going through a difficult time. They were okay to drink because of X, Y, or Z. And it's not just drink, it's about anything. Come on, it's about anything. Or, instead of justifying it, they would minimize it. Well, it probably wasn't right, right, but it wasn't that bad. Here is the danger in minimizing the Word. When you minimize the Word, you start disobeying, but then you start looking at the people that you love and justifying and minimizing their sin. And the nation of Judah did that repeatedly, where they would begin to look at the actions of their forefathers, perhaps even the, the actions of their spouses, perhaps the actions of their own children, and justify and minimize their sin. Come on, this is good stuff. This is preaching now, because we do it all the time. If you, if your wife dressed the way your daughter dressed, you'd pitch a fit. But you go, well, it's just the modern time. Whoa, 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 whoa. time out. What's the standard? What's the standard? The standard is not society. Come on, the, the standard is not the time of year. If you saw somebody in a snowstorm walking in a bikini, you'd be like, that person has lost their mind. But it's the 4th of July and 104 degrees, and we're like, oh, that's... Well, no, the standard doesn't change. The standard's the Word of God. The standard doesn't change. But because we love people, we'll start justifying. We'll start minimizing. We'll say things like, and I've heard this, listen, I've heard this from people who've sat in our church for, for Sunday after Sunday. They've said things like this. Well, they were born that way. They were born that way. You know what we're talking about. Come on. They, they were born that way. They, they, they couldn't help it. I mean, even from the time they were a little child, they were born that way. No, that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says choosing to leave the natural use of the woman. Your, your sexual orientation, quote unquote, is a choice that you make in your mind. You go, but, but no, no, but my, my son, my daughter, my granddaughter, my, 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 my uncle, my aunt, my whatever, I, I, I love them. Praise the Lord. And you should continue to love them. But your love for them does not change God's standard. 
But when you've lowered God's standard and you've disobeyed God's standard, now you'll start looking at the people you love and you'll start justifying their actions. I've heard it. I've heard it from people who, how about this? Well, they have a good heart. They have a good heart. They're standing in front of a judge for their third felony. They have a good heart. No, they don't. They have a wicked heart, just like yours, just like mine. Yeah. Well, they're doing well. They're doing well. They're doing well. They don't go to church. <clears throat> I said they don't go to church. They, they, uh, they don't witness for Christ. They don't, they don't tell other people about Christ. They're not doing well. But we're tempted to do that when we've lowered the standard. We say things like, well, I think God understands. I think God understands. What's the response from God? Verse number five. But I'll so send them a loving care package and implore them to do better. Verse number five. But I will send a fire upon Judah. And it shall devour the palaces of Jerusalem. God's frustrated with this good sin. This sin of the good people. And he starts with leadership. Well, let's see if we can summarize this as quick as we can. Of all the sins that we might be tempted to commit this morning, there might not be any that would carry a more dangerous consequence than repeatedly devaluing the word. Let me repeat that. Of all the sins that you and I might be tempted this morning, I, I, I don't know. I am capable of any sin. Let me be clear on that. I'm capable of any sin. In any sin under the sun, I am capable of committing because I am a sinner. Amen. Without the grace and walking in, in, the, in the fruits of the Spirit, I am capable uh, of any, any sin. But I doubt this morning I'm going to be tempted to do that hard drug. I mean, I'm just doubting it. I say that not because I'm super Christian, but... I, I, I wasn't tempted yesterday by doing, you know, I have never in my life been tempted to do heroin. Like, that's never, that's never entered into my mind. But I would be tempted to just take whatever value I've placed on the Word of God and not, not take the Bible and cast it out of my life, but just lower it just a little. Come on, it is 2024. Come on, we're in modern day America. Yeah, we're, 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 you know, a, a, an advanced civilization. Of all the sins that we might be tempted to commit this morning, there might not be any that would carry a more dangerous consequence than repeatedly devaluing the word where we make other things the standard instead of thus saith the Lord. Because as soon as we devalue the standard, we'll start disobeying the standard. And as soon as we start disobeying the standard, we'll start justifying others who are disobeying or minimizing what other, how others are disobeying. And we do that repeatedly. Where are we going to be as a civilization? Where are we going to be as a church? Come on, let, 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 let's not talk about America. Let's just talk about Calvary Baptist Temple. I don't know why. I, I don't know why you got to preach on clothing and standards. I don't know why you preach on music. You mentioned drinking and the King James Bible. You're just... No, 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 because we're going to keep, by God's good grace upon us, thus saith the Lord as the standard. And, not, and not, not polls, not data, not society, not our experience, not our feelings, not your grandma's opinion, not your granddaughter's opinion, but thus saith the Lord. And Judah just one day went, you know what? I mean, I know God says, but I, I think... I know God said, but, but my kid, I know God said, so I, would, I mean, it's, just, it's not that big of a deal. And they just lowered it just a little. And then they substituted what they thought. They substituted something else. They, they devalued it. What we devalue, we don't take care of. Come on. What we devalue, we don't take care of. My pennies are in the piggy bank, not, not going, you know, on eBay. They're going to the piggy bank because they're, they're, they're devalued. You, 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 you tend to start putting them aside. Then you disobey them. And then as you're disobeying them, you start looking around at the people that you love and you justify their, your error uh, uh, through lies. That, no, 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 it's not really that bad. No, it is that bad. God, God said it's that bad. And you make them more comfortable in their sin. And no one will ever come out of sin who is comfortable in sin. No one will ever come out of sin that's comfortable in sin. 
You know why I got saved? I was scared to death of hell. I'd love to say, oh, man, I got saved because I heard a message of Jesus and I just wanted him and I just loved him. And it's just No, I, I, I heard a message on Jesus' holiness and my notness. And you go, you weren't that close. Okay, fine. I, I didn't want to go there. And it was my uncomfortableness that brought me to the person of Jesus Christ for salvation. And I'm just going to go out on a limb here and guess when you got saved, it was probably similar. I don't, I've never really heard a testimony of, ha, I, I was in church and I, I walked forward and I was just like, Jesus is awesome and I'm awesome and I think this would be a good partnership. <laughs> I've never heard a message like that. Never, never, never heard anybody say that. It's the perfection of him and my lack thereof. So we dare not foster a church or a family where everybody's comfortable in disobeying the standard and not living up to the standard or will never meet the standard. You know why our kids get an F? To tell them, he didn't meet the standard. And you can change the F to an A, but they have not learned any more thing. They've not changed a lick. God helping us, God helping us, we're not gonna lower the standard. God helping us, we're not gonna change the standard. God helping us, thus saith the Lord is going to be the goal that we aspire to. That we fail. Oh, we fail. Oh, we fail. We fail, we fail, we fail. But that's what we're shooting for. That's what we're trying to live up to. Lord, I love you. Thank you for this word. I pray it help us, Lord, to avoid the sins of the quote-unquote good. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.